Rit. Um, and, 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 Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see all of you. I'm so glad you guys are all able to make it today. Um, and uh, yes, you probably enjoyed our one hour of sunshine this morning, uh, which was a nice uh, reprieve, I suppose, from constant grayness. It's been so gray lately, it feels like it's like seeping into my house. It's kind of gray that's like coming for you. Well, and there's, no, there's no color out there. You know, I know. The leaves, the leaves are gone. And, and then there's like a Fog and it's just like, hey, buddy. Have you ever read uh, C.S. Lewis? Uh, from time to time. It's well, it's his, it's his most, it's the book that was my favorite. Now, the title is misleading because it's called The Great Divorce, mm. but it's not about a, what you would think a divorce is. It's about someone that goes to hell, but hell is not the, hell, not the fire and brimstone like everyone thought it was. It's Minnesota weather with clouds and drizzle and snow, but forever. Mm -hmm. And the person there says, how can this be hell? I thought it was supposed to be fire and brimstone. And the Lord said, don't you know what really drives you crazy? Fire would be too bright and cheerful. And we want this to be a dull, dismal, gray, North Korea like And then, of course, his story is he... He gets out of hell by making some kind of a pact with the devil. Okay, well, thank you for that. All right, yeah, thanks for that. We're living in hell. I think that's the lesson of the story. Um, well, welcome, everybody. Uh, we're a little thinner in our room today, but we have lots of friends online, and we also have friends that are watching this via YouTube. Um, let me just make sure that I get another thumbs up from some of my online friends. Can you guys hear me? Okay, great. All right, so I think we'll move ahead. Um, so welcome back. Um, we, uh, we met once uh, in uh, a couple of weeks ago, and then we had MLK Day last uh, Monday. And so now we're back together. And I think we have three weeks in a row, and then it'll be President's Day, I believe. So uh, we are moving right along in our study. Are we off President's Day? Yeah, the building is closed. This is a federal holiday, so that, that, that typically closes up. And then there will be at least one Sunday that will be out, or one Monday, I should say, that we won't be meeting together for spring break, because I will be somewhere where there is sunshine. Oh, good for you. <laughs> and I hope that you will also be somewhere where there's sunshine. Um, let me say a quick word of prayer, and then we'll jump in together and get started. Lord, we thank you um, indeed for this day, uh, another day of life and breath, and another day to... Um, to love and to learn. We pray, Lord, that you're with us now um, as we grapple with um, the stories that are given to us, the book of Acts. We pray that you will be our teacher and our guide and that we will learn from you truly and genuinely. Open our hearts and our minds to what you have to teach us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. <clears throat> Um, so our last session, so just to kind of remind us where we are, uh, we are up into chapter nine of uh, the book of Acts. Um, and once you sort of leave chapter eight behind, you really you're kind of entering into the larger geographical story that Acts kind of recounts for us. If you remember, um, the very beginning of Acts, of course, is happening uh, in Jerusalem, essentially, or the environs around Jerusalem. And that goes on for about uh, eight chapters or so. Uh, and then we start to very rapidly move out of not only the environs around Jerusalem, but even Judea. We go into Samaria, we go down south um, with the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch, and then things are going to move quickly uh, beyond Jerusalem, um, eventually up to Antioch and then beyond, uh, as we will wind up following sort of the trail of Paul. So our last session, though, <clears throat> we uh, we hit on two things. One one is 
uh, the very remarkable, interesting story of the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. So if you remember, um, this is a story with uh, one of the deacons that we learn about. I believe it's back in chapter seven, six or seven. Um, uh, Philip, who is depicted as being in Samaria initially, and he's actually responsible for preaching the gospel to the Samaritans. Uh, before Peter and John are sent down there. And that already is kind of a step beyond sort of the, the confines of Jewish identity. You're moving into a realm that would have been certainly questionable for many. Uh, Philip, if you, if you recall, in this scene with the Ethiopian eunuch, it's kind of bookended by divine intervention. So God tells uh, Philip to go down to this road south of Jerusalem, which is essentially a deserted road, um, and Philip goes, uh, and what happens? He sees the Ethiopian eunuch, and we talked about sort of what the eunuch would have symbolized to a certain extent, um, perhaps to Philip, but certainly within a kind of Jewish frame of reference. He really would have been a representative of sort of the ends of the earth, um, and, and certainly in terms of uh, the knowledge of um, uh, you know, sort of the known, quote unquote, known world at that time in terms of going south, Ethiopia would have been considered right at the edges, even though we obviously know that the geography would have extended much, much further um, in the mind, right, in the kind of the imagination or the cosmography that someone like Philip would have been working for. This is, this is uh, remarkable. So this is the ends of the earth. Um, the eunuch uh, also is, I think, important because um, of his status, um, more than likely uh, a Jewish, or excuse me, a Gentile proselyte, which means he's converted, um, but he's not originally, you know, ethnically Jewish. He's also a eunuch, which means that there are certain precincts within the temple grounds that would not have been, he would not have been allowed to enter into. <clears throat> well, he has this encounter with Philip, he has this encounter with the gospel message of Jesus, and literally his response, which we kind of call attention to the interesting grammatical sort of way is, what is to prevent me from being, right? What can, what can withhold that from me? I've experienced other places where there are things that prevent me. Well, there's nothing that prevents me from being fully embraced uh, by Jesus and the gospel of the Jesus way. And that's sort of the story. Then Philip is whisked away, and we are returned um, in a, I think I, I call attention to this because of the, the literary flourish, but we are all of a sudden returned to the figure Saul, right, who is, it's just, the text tells us, uh, breathing murderous threats, right, going from house to house, in other words, persecuting essentially the church, especially in Jerusalem. Uh, he is he he um, secures uh, permission. Uh, the text doesn't really tell us exactly why. In fact, there was some kind of debate in the commentator commentators as to uh, you know sort of the appropriateness of all this. But he secures um, authority. I should, I guess we could say to go to Damascus, right, and also further his persecution or, or his uh, attempt to eradicate his movement. Um, so this started, we, we started then with, with the Saul story. Well, as he's on his way, as you all know, um, and I, 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 I actually did preface at the very beginning that this is probably one of the most well-known stories in the Bible. He's making his way to Damascus and he has what is Damascus Road experience. Right where uh, where Jesus literally shows up in the form of a vision, stops him cold, um, knocks him to the ground, puts him in a kind of posture of obedience, effectively, <clears throat> and Saul's days as persecutor of the church come to an end right then and there. He then is taken into the city. He's been blinded, which I think we can you know fair to say that this is sort of a physical manifestation. Of, a, of his own spiritual reality, um, that he had been blind in terms of what he was doing. Um, the Lord then, God then again uh, intervenes uh, in the life of, we don't know how big of a community, but there are Christians in Damascus 
Uh, we don't know exactly how they got there. Certainly, presumably, perhaps they were among the scattered from Jerusalem when the persecutions broke out. But God's like, um, hey, Ananias, there's this guy, Paul, or no, Saul, I'm sure you've heard of him. I need you to go to his house, you know, give the very direct instructions where to go and what to say to him. There's, there's no um, uh, mystery in this vision, right? as there can be in other visionary things. It's a very direct set of instructions. And Ananias is like, well, wait a minute. I have some questions, Lord. Isn't this the guy who I've heard only bad things about, who is, uh, seems to be hell-bent on destroying your people and attacking the way? <laughs> the Lord essentially responds to those objections and Ananias follows through in obedience, goes, and one of the really, I think, interesting moments in that whole scene is the way that Ananias addresses Paul or Saul. He says, brother Saul. He calls him a brother and uh, and and winds up to kind of get the conclusion of what essentially is a healing or miracle story uh, where he's healed of his blindness. And the first thing that he does is he is baptized. So that kind of brings us um, essentially uh, up to where we are now. And, and one of the things that I mentioned here, right, is we the way that this scene fits into a larger uh, trend or pattern that we're starting to see, which is uh, the idea that the the gospel community, right? The, this this community, which is starting to call itself church, um, is not going to be a closed circle. It's going to be an ever widening circle. Um, we we go from being a Jewish phenomenon, uh, uh, almost from its inception, it's multilingual. If you think about uh, the day of Pentecost. All of a sudden, it expands out a little bit more to include the Samaritans. Then it goes further with the eunuch. And now we have we have Saul, the great enemy at this point in time, at least, who now is being brought in. Right. So in other words, there's no one who's beyond God's reach. There's nowhere that is beyond God's reach. And of course, our next step, the very next story that we're going to enter into after the story about Saul is the, the inclusion of Cornelius. Not simply a Gentile proselyte, a, a Gentile, um, perhaps a God fearer. We'll talk a little bit about that, but that's kind of where this is going uh, in terms of the vision and the movement of Acts. All right. <coughs> so yes, um, as you're going through the circle, say, um, we we actually see uh, Saul Paul being part of that circle. Yeah, even those that hated the church, right, can be. Included. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I, I was, I, I wanted to make that point. I thought I did, but yeah, that's correct. That, that even the, the most ardent enemy, right, is not beyond God's reach. <laughs> so that's where this fits in terms of the arc of where you want to go. All right. So can I get a volunteer who's willing to read uh, our first passage? Okay, Susan or Jeff. Oh. Okay. For several days he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. All who heard him were amazed and said, Is, is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem among, Jerusalem among those who invoke this name? And has he not come here for the purpose of bringing them Bound before the chief priests, Saul became increasingly more powerful and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Messiah. After some time had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night so that they might kill him, but his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. All right. That goes to Jericho, right? Um, uh, Damascus. With the, the hole in the wall? I was thinking of the, of the Jericho moment, but yeah, you're right. Um, <clears throat> all right. So uh, we, we have then in verses 19 through 22, 
um, in a way, I think an elongation of the miracle story that we already have heard. I think it's at this point important to just remind ourselves that the way um, that the that miracles or miraculous events typically function in the biblical witness, this is especially the case in the Gospels, is it's not just about the physical healing itself. It's what that makes possible or symbolizes, et cetera, right? So it's not just that Paul receives a sight back. It's that in so doing, he becomes now someone who can see, someone who's um, restored or brought into, becomes a member of the community, et cetera. So that's the case, uh, I think, here as well. He stays here um, with the disciples in uh, Damascus, and I want to call attention to that um, uh, in particular because, in a sense, that's just as miraculous as the fact that he received his sight back, right? Given Paul's or Saul's uh, reputation, right, um, and given his aims of coming to Damascus, uh, it's it's no less of a miracle that he's being welcomed into this community uh, than that he receives uh, his sight back. Um, and I think it, it, if we follow this, and we kind of think about this moment of his being included into this Damascus community, and we and we read a little further, not very much longer, actually up, up at around verse uh, 26, we see that when Paul, or Saul, I'm sorry, I keep going Paul Saul, but when he tries to enter into the community in Jerusalem, they are very nervous about it. They don't want to have anything to do with it, right? So this Damascus kind of embrace um, is sort of singular in a way, uh, and, it, and it shows. And, and the healing, therefore, of Saul is not just the healing of his eyes. It's actually a healing of his whole orientation, his whole way of being, his whole reason for being. And then what happens? He is um, immediately that the energy that we will come, really come to um, be quite, I think, familiar with as we follow the story, as we move through Acts. But the energy that must have driven him as a persecutor is now fundamentally redirected. Um, and he becomes a witness, right, to Jesus. Um, and not a passive witness at all. Um, rather, probably, perhaps even an aggressive one. But it, what does it say to us? It says that immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying he is the son of God. Now, uh, there's a couple of things here that are interesting. One is the fact that this tells us about that redirection of energy. But the other is that this is the only place in Acts where Jesus is described as son of God. So this is a pretty significant descriptor in a sense. Um, that is on already the lips uh, of Saul, uh, even at the beginning. And, it, and I suppose it's probably funded in some ways by his own encounter with Jesus on the road, right? Jesus is not just uh, another human being per se, he's something more. What precisely what Paul meant, Saul meant by that title, not entirely clear, certainly has uh, definite connotations of needing to be associated with Yahweh. Uh, otherwise, though, uh, important moment. Um, what do we do? Uh, what do we have it then in starting in verse 21 and going through verse 22? All who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem among those who invoked this name? And has he not come here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? Saul became increasingly more powerful and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Messiah. All right. To understand the response of verse 21, it's important to, who is saying this? It is, is this a response of other Christians, or is this more than likely the response of the Jewish authorities or Jewish community? It's more than likely the latter, right? The, their response to him uh, is essentially, I would say, an attempt to undermine his credibility. How did you switch sides so quickly? In other words, didn't you come here for one reason and now you're doing this? Like you, you don't even know what you really think or believe. You know, you changed your mind so quickly. You can kind of hear uh, it being um, uh, uh, functioned in that functioning in that way. 
But Paul, Saul slash Saul, what does he do? He doubles down, right? Which is sort of, I think, his personality from what we'll see. Uh, it certainly seems to be the case if you, you read some of his letters carefully. Um, he intensifies his preaching and his arguments, and they further confound his opponents. Um, and so we get this, we're going to get sort of this dogged determination, um, this uh, passion, this energy, all of which originally have been aimed at the rooting out potentially and destruction of the community, and now is going to be put to a very different, um, a very different use. What happens, uh, the, just like before, just like we've seen, we've had a couple of iterations of this, and of course it stretches back into the Gospels. Um, uh, as the Gospel, I, I would say, uh, perhaps um, grows, its message grows, or people are responding positively, so also do you get resistance to that, right? Um, I think I used this phrase before, with the winds of change come the waves of resistance. It's kind of that same thing. It's almost like they go together. And that's what happens in verse 23. They go from arguing about it to we're going to kill it. Ooh, right? <clears throat> After some time had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night so that they might kill him. But his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. Now, as we think about this, and we remember, right, I mean, Paul himself is Jewish, right? So we keep hitting this language, the Jews. I think, that, to me, that should be a symbol and certainly function this way in Luke for the elite, right? Those, uh, those who had something perhaps at stake in terms of leadership or power uh, in the Jewish community. It's not just all Jews. Uh, I think that would be uh, uh, kind of irresponsible for us to see it that way. The other kind of interesting thing that I didn't notice really, I, I don't think I'd ever really noticed it, I mean, I probably read through this passage I don't know, many times, um, is that uh, that Saul is let down through a hole in the wall by his disciples, by Saul's disciples. Right? Uh, I think I probably glossed over that and thought it was the other disciples, it was the disciples of Jesus. And and none of the and I was surprised actually to make it my way through the commentators. None of the commentators said that this was a grammatical quirk or anything like that. They said it was more than likely something that you know he had drawn to himself people who were attracted by him. Now, how do we explain that? I think it's pretty easy to explain. Number one, we know that Saul slash Paul trained with Gamaliel, which means he himself was already a trained rabbi or training himself up to be, be a rabbi. And now he's simply replicating that. And he's, others are being drawn to him, uh, i.e. his disciples. So he's a trained rabbi. It doesn't seem all that strange that he would have attracted others. I think the other thing that we want to keep in mind, and I'm going to draw attention to this also when we move into the next set of verses 26 through 31, is the way that Luke is telling the story here, the time frame is significantly compressed um, to the point where we're going to get into the next four verses. And if we bring the verses here, the descriptions here about what Saul was doing up next to his own descriptions of what he was doing in the book of Galatians, and we can't, it's not, you can't fully square them, but if you could square them, it would have to be over four years. The four-year period is what's being described in these only these four verses. Mm -hmm. So we don't know, in other words, how long Saul precisely is in Damascus. Right? We, what I think we do need to realize is that this is not just a short, like it's not like he's there for two weeks, you know, and then they got to let him out down, down the hole in the wall. Um, he's been, he's probably there for a while. Yeah. Well, he had these disciples. Are these disciples that he had when he was a Jew and, and persecuting people. That's another to get them and say, okay, guys, we're going to change sides here. I mean, it's one thing for him to change sides, but right. he took these disciples with him, apparently. Right, and if I recall correctly, one of you also called attention to the fact when we went through the Damascus Road scene, it's not just that Saul gets up and goes in, it's that <laughs> Saul and his companions and so it's very much a plausible option that, that these were some of the companions that came with 
that maybe they were already his disciples or maybe they became so you know more so as they were studying together but either way an interesting moment right uh, in, in a sense that perhaps this is also a signal of his leadership ability of his potential to you know do the things that he eventually is going to be um, equipped and kind of commissioned to do all right any comments we'll take a little bite of this uh, Yummy snack here. <laughs> Some of questions, thoughts. They they uh, they don't make it hid in the Greek, uh, but um, taking him uh, the disciples by night. So it's not necessarily um, his disciples. Well, <clears throat> most of the commentators I've run into. Use the his, ah, which I thought was yeah, interesting. Yeah, but also um, um, back in in the Gospel of Luke, um, who's writing Acts as well, in the genealogy, uh, Luke Luke goes back to Adam, whose conclusion is he was the son of God. Sure, yeah, son of God language. So there would be so the same same writers putting the same word down. Well, the other, I mean, we could do an entire thing just on Paul's Christology. Yeah. What exactly did Paul think about Jesus? And he does use this epithet or this descriptor uh, for Jesus. So um, anyway, I just wanted to call attention to it because it's the only place it happens uh, in uh, in the book of Acts. All right, um, before I move on, are there any comments or questions from our friends online? <laughs> no, I just think, I think Diane is just loving life down there in Florida. <laughs> All right, can we move us forward then? Um, can I get a volunteer who's willing to read our next? Set of verses. Okay. <clears throat> when he had come to Jerusalem, he intent he attempted to join attempted to join the disciples. They were all afraid of him for the mm -hmm, not believing here. He, I'm sorry. It's, for they did not believe. Your, your, she's reading up the screen and your screen is blocked. There, it is. there we go. All right. Let's and they did not believe. <laughs> For they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him, brought him to the apostles, and described for them how on the road he had seen the Lord who had spoken to him. And now in Damascus he had spoken boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He spoke and argued <laughs> with the Hellenists, but they were attempting to kill him. <laughs> when the believers learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Meanwhile, the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and was built up living in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. All right, thank you very much. Um, so the, this is a bit of a, um, <clears throat> this section is a, is a is when I got into uh, reading through the commentaries and kind of thinking about this, I could have gone down some interesting rabbit holes and I decided <laughs> not to. Uh, because I just don't have time to do that. <laughs> Not something that you could do very easily uh, when you're working as a pastor. Uh, but the, the big rabbit hole question of these verses is a comparison between these verses and the itinerary that Paul himself describes um, of this early part of his life after his conversion, after his seeing Jesus, which happens in Galatians chapter 1, verses 15 through to 21. All the commentators note that there are significant discrepancies, and it is difficult to know precisely 
where Paul really is. And of course, they're going to typically trust Paul's telling of where he was over against Luke, because Luke is going to be dealing in some way or another with secondhand knowledge, uh, especially if it's written at the time that we think it's written. Um, so there are discrepancies between these two accounts. But the one thing that I took away from kind of reading in the different commentators and their sort of takes on this is this idea that now we're starting really in the story of Acts to get passages that really are significantly compressed in terms of the time frame. And I think that's important for us as we think through, like, you know, some of these things did not happen immediately in the way sort of that it sounds, but of course, more, you know, Luke's got to tell a story and you got to move forward, etc. So if you could reconcile to some extent, even if I think even the closest reconciliation, there's still something where it's like a question mark. The idea is that these five or so verses cover around three years. So this is a three-year period in what, of, of what we're talking about. <clears throat> now, why is that important? I mean, it's not, on one hand, it's not super important. It's not like it's a make or break in terms of everything. But I do think it's an interesting, if it is a compressed time frame, the response of the Jerusalem church to Paul, right? So because what do we hear in verse 26? When he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. Now, I want to highlight this because what does the Jerusalem church represent? In a sense, it represents the center of leadership. And the center of leadership, what we're going to see as we move through the story of Acts, struggles pretty significantly to believe that God could possibly do be doing what God is doing out on the periphery, right? They struggle with the idea that Peter should have gone in and eaten with Cornelius, a Gentile. They struggle with what's going on in Antioch. So yeah, they're going to struggle here, right? I think that's sort of the thing that you can take away from it. And that struggle becomes, I think, all the more interesting if this really is a much longer time frame. They have a lot of time. In other words, they're not being forced within a week to make a decision about whether they're going to let Paul hang out with them or not. Right? If this is a two to three year time frame, it's probably longer than that, at least some portion, some chunk of that. So what we see then, I think, in verse 26 is, number one, an understandable fear, but also, number two, a kind of um, uncertainty. Right? did not believe that he really was a disciple. Um, and, uh, and, and I think this fits, actually, interestingly enough, uh, in the way that the, the church itself is depicted uh, moving through Acts. Oftentimes, it is the church that needs to be converted as much as it is anybody else. And I think that's kind of what we see uh, here. Mm -hmm. So they're not prepared, as I say, uh, to, to believe that God might be at work in Saul's transformation. And again, it's more remarkable if we're dealing with a much longer time frame. What happens? Another figure, um, sort of beloved, that we've already encountered, we've already sort of gotten a sense of the warm-hearted, um, good-naturedness of this person, steps in on behalf of Saul, Barnabas, right? So I describe Barnabas here in some, in some sense uh, as a bridge. And he's described right in verse 27. He comes, he comes in and, and essentially functions um, as, as a kind of witness to the truth of what uh, has happened with Saul um, uh, up in the, in the city of Damascus. So yet again, he steps in and is depicted as a very positive force. And he, of course, is going to become a companion of Paul uh, in their first missionary journey. As I mentioned here, he corroborates Saul's story and he makes possible. Saul being brought then uh, into the community uh, to be embraced. And that's what we hear in verse 28. Verses, I think, uh, 28 through 30, um, I don't necessarily need to read these, but they literally kind of repeat to us that pretty much what was happening with Saul up in Damascus is now happening with Saul down in Jerusalem. He's, he's part of the community. He's going in and out. What does he fill his time with? Preaching, teaching, debating, etc. Kind of the typical things that rabbis do, really. 
Um, and also, of course, someone now who's been recommissioned to be a witness uh, and teacher uh, about Jesus. So a repetition of verses 19 through 25. And a repetition of the response that we saw earlier, right? Um, what happens? It, it, things escalated in Damascus from words to actions. We hear here the same thing. Things are about to escalate from words to actions. What do they do? They ship him off uh, to his hometown. And there was a big, actually interesting question um, that some of the commentators raised in a sense having to do with uh, verse 31. Verse 31 reads like a summary statement, right? And I think I've told you before that Luke likes to use summary statements uh, throughout the book of Acts. Some of them are more elaborate than others. So this is often used or seen as a candidate as a summary statement. But uh, the question is, is sending and getting rid of Saul, putting like putting him on a boat and sending him back to his hometown, is that why the church all of a sudden enjoys a time of peace? Or is it simply that they're enjoying a time of peace uh, because God is kind of standing around and protecting them? Um, it's an open question, I suppose, uh, there. What do we hear, though, in verse 31? Meanwhile, the church was built up throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. And now we have Samaria added, right, to this roll call, um, as I mentioned here. It had peace and was built up, living in the fear of the Lord and, and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. So it is spreading. So even though it is facing resistance, um, that resistance is not enough to stop the growth uh, and the spread of the gospel. All right, let me stop there and see if there are comments or questions. What's well, interesting is the script is giving the Lord the credit for the expansion, as opposed to the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem. Right. And that was your point earlier, that you know the people that thought they were in charge are no longer, uh, in this case, given credit for that. The Lord is giving the credit. Right. right. But who's the primary actor in the story? The Spirit. It's constantly the Spirit is the primary actor. And there's sort of a sense of looking for a human partner, but it's the Spirit who sort of is pushing ahead, the Spirit who is doing the work, etc. Is that the oh, someone? Sorry. Not mine. Is at the door? Oh, if that went off in my house, the dog would be all over you. Yeah. Yeah. Tell you. Well, someone here is a dog barking too in their home. Is that Jeff? Is that you? <laughs> yeah, I know that. Other, I love other it. comments or questions? Mm -hmm. I'd it on you write the timetable, it was really key here. If this all happened over five years, nobody would really be. All that bent up about it, right? But the fact that it happened in less than them, some unknown squish of time. Well, I think it's pretty remarkable that this happens over the course of at least three years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so the the fact that it's a longer period of time, um, and, and to me, works in the opposite direction. It took them a while to come around mm -hmm. to Paul. At least that's kind of a, the possible implication. Yeah. Now the text says uh, they had peace. Is yeah. that peace within them or peace between them and the Jews or who was not at peace? I I think the way that I would read this is um, there are three options that you could read this. One of them I think is the funny one, but I don't I wouldn't necessarily they had peace because the contentious person Saul was sent off. And so all this all the problems that he was raising kind of went away. That's one option. I don't think that's necessarily it, but it's an interesting one to think about, especially what we know of his personality later on. The second one is they, they had an internal peace. I don't think that's necessarily here, though it's not ruled out. I think it really is that the, whatever the persecution was seems to have died down. I think that would, that would to me, be the way to read that. Yeah. Good question. Yeah, Tom? Um, yeah. Galatians gives us a three-year period, uh, but also it tells us that Paul said that some time in Arabia, right? Which could be just anywhere out in the wilderness. Exactly, it could be in the environs around Damascus itself. Right. Yeah, that's right. Other uh, comments from folks online? 
Okay, all right. All right, well then let's move forward. All right, can I get a volunteer as one to read? I'm going to sit in there for you. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome. Well, verse 32? Yes, starting in verse 32. Now, as Peter went here and there among all the believers, he came down also to live, um, also to the saints living in Lydia, uh, where he found a man named Anaris, who had been bedridden for eight years, for he was paralyzed. Peter said to him, Anarius, Jesus Christ heals you, get up and make your bed. And immediately he got up, and all the rest residents of Lydia and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. Now in Gapa, there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She devoted she was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At that time, she became ill and died. When they had washed her and laid her in the upstairs, since Lydia was near Joppa, the disciples who heard that Peter was there sent two men to him with the request, please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them. And when he arrived, he took him. They took him to the up to the room upstairs. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter put them all outside, and then he knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha. <clears throat> then she opened her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he showed her to be alive. This, came, this became known throughout Joppa and many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, he stayed in Joppa for some time with a certain pet with certain Simon a tanner. All right, thank you. All right, so now we come to <clears throat> what I think kind of feels in the flow of the narrative as sort of something of a, of a brief interlude. Um, we've had, I think I, used, I actually wound up preaching on one of these passages um, last year, I think it was last summer maybe, and um, uh, the the story of the conversion of Samaria and the, and the Ethiopian eunuch and and then Saul and you know Cornelius is coming. It feels like you're going into the mountains, so, you know, and it's just one big mountain after another. Well, this story doesn't feel, in some ways, like it kind of fits into that you know soaring sensibility. Um, and so I think it is fair to say that it feels a little bit like an interlude uh, in a sense. Um, the, in terms of that, then what, what is Luke trying to do here? Like, what's the function then of these stories? Why are they here? The best argument um, that I encountered for that is that in some ways, these are stories meant to convey to us what verse 31 was just talking about, right? That the communities experienced peace and care and they grew, right? And so here we have two stories um, with that in mind, two healing stories that also lead to many people turning to, to the Lord right? because of that. So uh, I think that's, a, to me, a very plausible reason why Luke decides of course, to keep it here. It also obviously moves along the story and, and brings, you know, Peter, 
He's now in the environs, the locale that he needs to be in for the really big episode that's about to happen. That's going to take two full chapters to explore, uh, and that is the conversion of Cornelius and the and the inclusion of the Gentiles. The the second thing <clears throat> that I wanted to highlight is. Uh, and we haven't, I'm not sure if we've encountered this as much. I, I, when, I, when I remembered it, I was like, I guess it, it does show up maybe in some other places in Acts. But in Luke, um, in the Gospel of Luke, um, the writer of that Gospel is very um, fond of sharing doublet episodes, right, uh, where a healing happens and there's two different healings sort of stacked on top of each other. Or there's two different people that the Lord visits, or there's two different people that have visions. And oftentimes what we find, particularly in the Gospel of Luke, is Luke has a real proclivity for making those doublets a male and a female. And sometimes the female, uh, and I think very prominently in many places, um, is the sort of the more important person or gets more of the... Um, uh, more pressed. And the one, to me, the great example of this, of course, is Mary and um, uh, the father of uh, John the Baptist, Zachariah. Right? They both have a vision. They're both visited by an angel. Their responses, of course, are different. Uh, but there's one, the one right, that gets more of that press right, is going to be uh, uh, Mary. But then you immediately move you know, into the environs of the temple, and you have Simeon the prophet and Anna the prophetess. And so you have this pattern, in other words, in Luke, that shows up actually quite a bit in the gospel. And so it doesn't surprise us here that we have two healing stories, one with a man and one with a woman. But now Tabitha, it's, it's more than a healing. She's raised from the dead, basically. Right, right. And so it, that, that's sort of that ups the ante. That's serious healing. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> it really ups the ante in a pretty significant way. Um, so the story starts in the town of Lydda, which is um, uh, northwest of Jerusalem. Um, the uh, I was kind of doing, I don't know why I looked it up, but it's currently, it's present day called Lod, L-O-D, and it's pretty close to Tel Aviv. So if you've been to uh, Israel or whatever, then you kind of know that I've never been, but that kind of gives us a sense though, right, we're, we're leaving behind Jerusalem in a way, right? Uh, and we're following the gospel as it spreads north and a little bit east in Damascus, and eventually they'll spread out west as well. And we only get to follow a little bit of that story, though. Also, Joppa is uh, Joppa. With, yeah, and, and with, it was where, associated uh, with Jonah. Yeah, well, yeah. Well. yeah. There's, there's a great story. There. Yeah, right, right. The resurrection story, right? <clears throat> um, so the first of, of the two vignettes is in verses 33 through 35, and it deals with this man, Aeneas, um, who we don't know a ton about, um, but let me just kind of read this. There he found a man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden for eight years, for he was paralyzed. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and make your bed. And immediately he got up. And all the residents of Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. So, first of all, it's a pretty straightforward story, right? I mean, there's a healing, and the function of the healing is beyond the actual event itself. It's, of course, if we think about that this person is paralyzed for eight years, um, is healed and restored, there's a lot there about restoration to community, restoration to being able to work and labor and do the things that one would be able to do or would be unable to do if one were uh, uh, limited in the way that it sounds like he is. Um, beyond that, of course, uh, there might be some other elements. Uh, one of the things that I kind of thought was at least intriguing to think about, I'm not saying that this is the reason that's there, is that Aeneas is a very, very uncommon name in the ancient world. Um, and certainly at this time, it would have been, and certainly also in this region. However, there is one very famous Aeneas that um, would have been known through uh, Latin Greco-Roman literature. Are any of you familiar with the Aeneas that I'm talking about? 
He's the subject of the great epic poet, uh, poem by Virgil, the Aeneid, right? And what is Aeneas responsible for? <clears throat> He's responsible for the founding of Rome. So one commentator pitched the idea that um, perhaps this name is more than just the name of an, an individual. Perhaps it is a, something of a symbol, right? That here is someone who bears the name of the empire who living under the impress of the empire basically is human refuse until Jesus comes along and comes into his life, which I think is actually a pretty powerful symbolic uh, way of reading this, right? Um, so that his name again, and is symbolic of the Roman empire because Aeneas is a significant, he's sort of the figure that basically takes the Trojan remnant and, and takes it and eventually founds the Rome as what, a city. What story did you say that's in? That's in the Aeneid. A-E-N-E-I-D? That sounds right, yeah. I, I need to check my uh, spelling, but yes, that sounds correct. So if that is the case, if this name is symbolic, and remember, names in biblical texts are very important because we don't often get names. And if we do get a name, it tells us, number one, this person is important, or number two, this name bears more meaning than just that it signifies a person here. So that I think that's why this opens up the possibility, at least, of thinking about this, uh, whether or not it's, it's the correct final way to interpret it or not. I think that would leave that question open. But if it is, then it's a, it's a sort of pushback, right, on Rome. And Rome, what is Roman peace? Well, it leaves people, it leaves human refuse. That's what Roman peace does. But what is the actual peace that we heard described in verse 31? What does that look like? It looks like the healing of this. Right? It looks like his restoration. And that's why people turn, uh, because it's a contrast. Beyond that, of course, the story itself, as I said here, uh, unfolds in a way that's quite typical to other miracle stories that we have. And the result ultimately is not simply the healing and restoration of this man, but the kind of reorientation of the entire community. Lydda, the town, um, uh, is not very far from the coast. And I think the region that reaches from the town of Lydda up to the coast is called the Sharon. So that whole idea of Lydda and Sharon, that there's a sense in which this thing, this information about this uh, travels a good bit. And of course, it's probably hyperbole that everyone turns to the Lord, but the idea is that a significant chunk, so many people turn uh, that it's almost like it's everyone. So they come, these people come to place their trust in Jesus and to follow after. Um, and then, of course, again, to remind ourselves, we don't know exactly how the small community that included Aeneas in it already even came to the town, though we have some, you know, sort of conjectures here and there. I just, I love to put the emphasis on that. And Paul and others kind of go to towns and they find that there's already Christians there. Like, how did they get there? It kind of tells you that it's not really up to Paul. It's up to the spirit who's already been working and guiding and leading other people, et cetera. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting that these are all in the area of Samaria. So it kind of fills in that gap. But it kind of sketches more of that in. Yeah. But also it's interesting, uh, could this be like, you know, eight years from the time of the resurrection as well? How so? What do you? Um, well, he says uh, he's been bedridden for eight years. I mean, time's progressed. Yeah. You know, three years here, three years there. You know, right. Yeah. You could probably be pretty close. You to could be within the, it's, at the very least, you could probably be within sort of spinning, you know, distance of the time of Jesus's ministry, mm -hmm. you know, which is a three-year <coughs> period, right? And then you've got at least maybe two years of all the yeah. stuff we heard about in, you know, the first eight chapters. And then, yeah, so yeah, that's possible. I, I, I don't think anyone that I, any of the commentators pointed that out, but that is very possible. Yeah. Because eight is not, well, a, I don't remember eight. <laughs> Yeah, is it? Is it? Because I don't remember any of the commentators sort of pointing out the symbolic value of number eight, but it, it, yeah, maybe, maybe that's interesting. Um, then we get this, the next story, which 
this is the one that I wound up preaching on actually. And I I remember I was, it was kind of dumbfounded in some ways by being brought back into to touch with it. Um, and this is the story of Tabitha or uh, Dorcas. Um, now I mentioned here at the uh, opening sort of comment on your outline that this story has really had an outsized influence. And I, I do mean that in a sense because, you know, there are so many stories in the book of Acts uh, and many of them, of course, have also had significant influence, but so has this one, this little short vignette about this woman. Um, Dorcas uh, or Tabitha becomes a kind of figure of um, great renown and, and a deep respect, someone to be emulated, in other words, um, in the history of the church. So as the church itself develops, um, you can find church fathers and mothers appealing to the example, which we only have like a little verse or two here to tell us what Tabitha did. Um, and now you can go into some churches and they'll have Tabitha rooms or Tabitha ministries or Dorcas ministries or whatever, right? Or anything really where people make clothing has some kind of connection to this episode. Uh, and of course, it, that episode, of course, has a deeper connection uh, to Jewish tradition, probably more broadly. <clears throat> but the earliest reference I could find was in the 300s. Uh, and that was with Basil the Great, Basil of Caesarea, who talks, who was very concerned about widows in his um, kind of the region where he was a bishop. And he talks a lot about Tabitha as the kind of person that we should, as a church, emulate. Uh, and, uh, and of course, he himself, Basil, sold his family's estate and gave all the money to, the, to feed people because the region was going through a massive um, famine. So who is this? So starting then in verse 36, <clears throat> now in Joppa, there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity or acts of mercy would be the other way that you could translate that. So the first thing we hear then is the name Tabitha or Dorcas. And in both cases, this name means uh, gazelle. And I think what that conveys to us is that this is a person of great energy and great with great alacrity she served her community. So when she was doing these acts of mercy, you know, she was a very vigorous, engaged uh, person. Um, she is, uh, we also have the name Tabitha and, and Dorcas. I don't have a, a thing up here for this, but I think that's important because Tabitha would be the Aramaic or Hebrew and Dorcas would be the Greek. Why do we, why are we given both names? Well, we're given both names more than likely because she was known among the Aramaic speakers and the Greek speakers. And right? so she was someone who was able to traverse different cultures. Now, Greek speakers here could simply be Greek speaking Jews. It doesn't necessarily mean um, like non-Jewish uh, folks, but still that movement back and forth, I think is important. In other words, she did not withhold her love based on some sort of ethnic identity or you know, whether you spoke a certain language or not. Also, another example of the Saul Paul. So the Saul Paul distinction. Yeah, that's true. That's right. The other thing that I think is also very important is that this is the only time in the New Testament where we get a feminine form of the word disciple. So we not only get this woman's name, we get her name twice. And we get the, the, the descriptor disciple applied to her, um, which is the only place, uh, again. So this is a very, very important figure. And I think that also helps us understand why the community appears to be so deeply broken when she dies, right? Um, and that's what we get uh, in uh, starting in verse 37. So 37 through 39, at that time she became ill and died. <clears throat> when they had washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples who heard that Peter was there sent two men to, to him with the request, please come to us without delay. Um, so Peter got up and went with them, and when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. All the widows stood beside him, weeping 
and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. So what well, what is this? I think it, I think that little you know passage there com, conveys to us the deep compassion and love that that this community had for this woman because of the, the acts of service. And also maybe even how essential she was to the life of the community. Um, when I, I remember when I preached on this, I raised the question of like, they're not, it's not only that they're weeping for the loss of Tabitha, it's what her loss will represent. That to lose a person like this, of this kind of energy, of this kind of engagement, of this kind of love, what is our, what is our future going to be like, right? She was amazing. Right. And so I think I just raised that as something to at least think about. Uh, and then we get this description of a very typical thing in the ancient world, which is the washing of a dead body in preparation for its burial. But this is the only place it appears, I think, in the whole of the Bible, actually, that description, even though we know about it from all kinds of external sources, but that's what people typically did. Well, yeah. <laughs> her seamstress talent, you the benefit for or that the business or all of the above. So, uh, so I think then this is where the comment about the widows, and this certainly is the way that the church has interpreted this, um, because when Basel brings this up, he's saying it's the care for the most vulnerable. That's what makes Tabitha so remarkable. And um, and there are two things at play here. One is. It's the widows, right? Like, so uh, I think the passage, right, um, it, it highlights, right, the widows. Let's see, if you go down to verse 41, after he's raised her up, he gave her his hand and helped her up, then calling the saints and the widows. So there's sort of this conspicuousness about the widows and the fact that she must have been particularly concerned about the widows. And of course, who was a widow? A widow was a, was someone who was not just had lost, you know, a husband or a spouse, but they were in a very socially precarious situation, right? They could um, easily fall into destitution if they weren't cared for. And so we have very long, you know, history of the church taking care uh, of them, just like Jewish tradition in general would have argued for. That's number one. Hold on. And then number two is the act of giving clothing is an act of, of, of dignity, right? When you give someone a, a, a piece of clothing, when you make a piece of clothing for them and you give that to them, it, it has a kind of profound sense of an act of recognizing them as a fellow human being and giving them the kind of dignity, the, the covering of that. So this isn't just about helping the poor um, from a distance, right? It's sort of like seeing their full humanity. And that's what, you know, so she, she becomes kind of this really interesting figure, I think, for thinking about that. Yeah, thank you. My um, footnotes say that it's the only place in the New Testament that they give disciple heading to a woman. That's right. That's right. That's, that's exactly right. It's the feminine form of disciple. This is the only one. Mm. I think it's interesting at the Minnesota Veterans Home, the first thing they do for each person coming in is give them a handmade cloak. And that stays with them and you, you put them on them every yeah. day. And it's just a way of saying welcome and we care about you. We and we see your humanity. And they're all made by the um, veterans of foreign wars and the American Legion. Yeah, so when I preached on this passage, what I said, and I'll, I'll just share that now, is that on some level, like Tabitha is about to be raised up by Peter, but on some level, what Tabitha was already doing was resurrection-like to these women, these widows. So it's almost like her being raised up is like a seal on her, tr the truth of her witness and, the, and what she, the, you know, the real meaning of what it was that she was doing. Like that's the miracle in a way it was the fact that she was already practicing resurrection is the language that I used to steal a title of a book by Eugene Peterson. Um, all right. So what about the event of resurrection itself? Um, pretty typical uh, if we think about Luke's gospel and, and really some of the, 
miracle stories there with Jesus and even the early church. And what I mean by that is that this is about to be like, you know, a miracle of a different order, right? Um, because it's, we're talking a resurrection, okay? And what does Peter do? He puts the people out of the room. He won't allow this to be a spectacle. This is not going to be a Hollywood show. TMZ is not going to be able to film this on his phone kind of thing, right? That's not the point, right? And if that, and if that did, if that spectacle component, in a way, is in some sense the temptation that oftentimes seems to, and I think that's what we said when we were talking about Simon Magus, right? He wants to buy the power of the spirit. You know, he gets he gets caught up in the spectacle mm-hmm. as opposed to the reality. Mm-hmm. So the way that it's described here is in a very, I think, matter of fact way. And what do we see Peter do? He puts the people out the room and he takes a posture that if we've read the gospel of Luke already, it's going to sound very familiar, right? He gets down on his knee. He prays and he, and he grabs her by the hand and lifts her up. And this, this literally evokes other scenes where Jesus does the same thing. So what I mean here is that he is basically doing something he's seen done before. Right? Do we have any examples before this of disciples raising people from the dead? No, we do not. Not that I can recall. Okay. Um, we have people hoping that the disciple's shadow, right, will follow them. Uh, but I don't think we have another, yeah, not yet. Um, so, uh, and then the language, you know, he said basically in our, in the NRSV that I uh, had you read, he says, Tabitha, get up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which is like, that sounds like what I say to my son when he's like overslept. I'm like, Elijah, get up. <laughs> but the actual Greek here is Tabitha arise. And so in the word arise there is, is root connected to Anastasia, which is resurrection. So it's like literally resurrection language, what he says. And so she arises, she is raised from the dead. So the event itself is described matter of factly, but then the response to it, right, is, is the remarkable thing, right? Um, what does he do? He gives her back to those who love her, the saints and the widows, and this becomes known in the town, and many turn to the Lord, right? And so a similar story that what we heard about Aeneas, now even kind of the, the ante is up, um, and that's particularly the case here uh, with the woman. Then we get verse 43, which is sort of a, you know, a pauser, you know. Meanwhile, he, being Peter, stayed in Joppa for some time with a certain Simon, Now, this is where Peter is going to hear from Cornelius, and the whole Cornelius story is going to start. Um, It is worth noting a couple things that I I had myself thought of, uh, but had kind of encountered again when I was doing the research on that, and that is the fact that um, a tanner is someone who does what? Works with another. Dead animals. Exactly. They work with dead animals and they work with leather and they probably work with all kinds of dead animals. But, but, but also and smelly and he's kind of an outcast. It's, yeah. So Peter is staying already in a place that would be questionable um, uh, as when he's staying with Simon the Tanner. And it tells us that Simon's house is like right on the coast, which means that he can see the ships coming and going. And the ships, many of the ships have what? Sails. And he's going to have a vision in a few minutes where a sheet or a sail is lowered down with all these animals on it. So the sort of back, sort of the content that winds up making up the vision is pretty close to where he's been staying, in a sense. Um, did you have a phone thing? Yeah, I, I once did a year in the Bible, which was two years in the Bible here. Uh, okay. And uh, so you're off the hook. Okay, <laughs> but it was mentioned that in the in Jewish custom or law, um, if a woman married a tanner, that was the only reason that a woman could divorce, mm. because of the wow. stench. Yeah, because because just the perspective on this person. Yeah, that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, 
All right, here's what we're going to do. We're kind of getting closer. I want to read the first passage, and then I have a series of opening comments that I'll make, and then we'll come back next week and we'll explicate the passage. All right, does that sound good? Okay. So, because um, it, because it, this really is one of the this story is really one of the pivotal moments in the whole book of Acts, and I want to make sure that we give it the justice and time that it needs. Um, okay, so let me get a, um, a volunteer who's willing to read our passage. Peggy, you look like you're okay. In Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, the centurion of the Italian cohort, as it was called. He was a devout man who feared God and all his household, with all his household. He gave alms generously to the people and prayed constantly to God. One afternoon at about three o'clock, he had a vision, which he clearly saw an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius, saying to him, Cornelius, he stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? He answered, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa for a certain Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging with Simeon, excuse me, with Simon a tanner whose house is by the seaside. When the angel who spoke to him had left, he called two of his slaves and a devout soldier from the ranks of, whose, of those who served him. And after telling them everything, he sent them to Joppa. All right. So we're going to come back, as I said, and do explication. But let me just kind of give some comments here. Um, and I really have three sort of opening points that I want to make in regard to this story. The first is um, that this really is a kind of revolutionary moment uh, in the life of the community. Uh, I think it'd be, it would be difficult to overstate the importance of what is about to happen and sort of what then kind of happens. And, and even if we just, you know, not even thinking about the meaning of it from a biblical frame, simply the history of the church, right? Which becomes predominantly Gentile uh, pretty quickly, actually. Uh, so it's, it's, over, it's difficult to overstate the importance here of what's about to happen in terms of the shape that the church itself takes on. Um, now, one can argue, I think, about was it really was it really God's intention that the church become only Gentile or not? So that could be, you know, you know, it could be that maybe God envisioned multiple cultures together, including a Jewish uh, culture. But obviously, over time, uh, that was proved more difficult. Even though I think today you might have more of that uh, bridge building going on, but at, at its heart. What I think this episode signifies is that, um, that the, the Jesus way and the Jesus message and Jesus himself is for everyone, right? That the movement um, is not going to be a closed circle. It's not going to be, we already know it's not going to be linguistically determined. Um, you know, by being an Aramaic only or a Hebrew only movement, because there's all these, you know. Uh, Hellenistic or diaspora Jews who speak all kinds of other languages. And we've been tracking now, right, the circle getting wider and wider. And now all of a sudden, once you get into Gentile, that's everything from, from a Jewish perspective. It was Jews, Gentiles, there might be a couple of groups in between, but that was it. So once the, the gate is open, it's open, right? And so it's going to be an ever-expanding movement. And as it expands out, changes are going to probably happen. And uh, I talked a lot of, actually about this in the class I did on mission um, last year, right, where the translation, the need to translate, and not just translate, you know, from one language to another, but to actually translate, you know, what does it mean to follow Jesus in a non-Jewish context? What does that look like? We already are going to see this happen in chapter 15, where they're going to say, 
you can be a Christian, but you don't necessarily have to, you know, keep all the laws of Moses. But here are a few things that we do want you to do, right? That's a translation. That's a change, right? A translation from what was to what is now. And I think this becomes then the moment where you start to see that engine kind of rev revving up and moving forward so that the gospel is, is always being uh, translated. Of course, we can say that we already see that, I suppose, in chapter two. All right, a revolutionary process that is going to go in all kinds of different directions, but also, of course, a profoundly disruptive process, right? Um, and I think uh, Luke gives us a little bit smoother picture, but if you really want the picture, like you want to understand how contentious this was, read Paul and read particularly Paul's uh, epistle to the Galatians, where he makes it quite clear. Um, and it's an ongoing struggle. In fact, I think it's in Galatians where he says, there are people who still don't agree about this, but I wish they'd go ahead and just castrate themselves. Yeah. Like that's what it, that's what, how angry he is. So this is a disruptive, right? It's, it's a, it has an apocalyptic character to it uh, in the sense of disruption. Uh, revolution is not, um, you know, can be great every once in a while, but it comes with profound disruptions. Um, and what does it disrupt? It disrupts the expectations and the understanding of the church itself, right? Um, the, the leaders in the church are functioning with a mosaic vision, right? Um, and, and what God is doing is screwing it all up. Dag nab it, you know, stop it. Uh, one of my friends said, I'd love to say, Jesus messes everything up. And that's, and that's what he meant. Um, we want, you know, we, we want or we have an expectation that things should look this way, but God sort of seems to have other expectations, other desires. Um, and that's what moves this in such a profound way. And Acts bears witness to this in particular, because it takes three full chapters to deal with this issue. And even at the end, I would suggest it's probably not fully dealt with. Right. So we have chapter 10, where we're going to hear about the actual encounter between um, Peter and Cornelius. He's going to go to his house, all this stuff. Then he has to go in chapter 11 back to Jerusalem. And they're like, why are you eating with Gentiles? What are you doing? So he has to actually retell the story again. And so literally chapter 11 is almost a verbatim retelling of the story to the leadership. And they at the end are like, oh. They literally are like, oh, so God is giving the spirit to the Gentiles as well. That's what they say. A very like deflating climactic moment, really. And then we get back, and all of a sudden, the first sort of truly multicultural church in the city of Antioch then becomes a source of agitation to the point where people have to go and they to, back to Jerusalem to convene a council. How are we going to navigate this? So the issue like doesn't necessarily go away and it's fraught in a way that we might say. Uh, just, yes. Just uh, clarity here. Um, that the word Gentile means nations. And um, part of Paul's vision was in order if if all the Gentiles became Jews, um, you wouldn't have a fulfillment of the scriptures saying that the nations have come up to worship God. Sure. Yeah. And so Paul's working within a very a definite option within the kind of Jewish set of options. That's right. And so he's seeing it as a fulfillment of prophecy, right? That there has to be both Gentile and Jews. Well, Paul, up. I think Paul probably comes to see that. Yeah more than anything. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting as you move through is, uh, and I'll say this in a second, is the way that the church, even Peter, has to be converted again and again in this regard. Right? And this then leads to the last point, right? It's, it's, it's revolutionary, it's disruptive, but in the end, this really is the work of God. This is the work of the Spirit. And this is one of those places that when I've said things like the primary actor, the main agent in the story is the spirit, and I know I've said that ad nauseum, I'll keep saying it, I guess. Um, but the reason is because of this place. I mean, this is really in some ways a hinge 
in the whole story of the, of the early uh, coming into being of the movement. He and all this then, right, <clears throat> is the action of the spirit. And Peter has to be converted. And I think if we, it not, and I'm thinking here, not only the vision that Peter sees, because he's not, he doesn't understand the vision even until he gets to Cornelius' house. And even then, when he first encounters Cornelius, um, he sort of is kind of terse with him. And then he kind of says, oh, well, maybe God's not a you know, respecter of persons. And, but, and, you know, if we read Paul, it sounds like Peter wasn't fully convinced, right? Because he starts withdrawing, et cetera. So conversion is an ongoing process in this uh, disruptive reality. It's not smooth. And what I think is kind of interesting to, in my mind in this regard, uh, given our church setting or whatever, is that this is not a church growth strategy. <laughs> Right, this is not something that was cooked up by marketing <laughs> professionals or uh, whoever the case may be, right? Um, uh, put together by the leadership and charged out. This is like literally they were dragged with their kicking and fighting, right? Because this is what God is actually trying to do, um, right? So it's this calling of the church to be converted and transformed itself. Um, and this becomes language that is used. Um, I don't know that it's used in the context of church, which is unfortunate because that's probably where it needs to be used the most. But it is used in the in the sort of world of theology under the heading the ongoing conversion of the church. The church has to be converted itself, uh, and that's what God is up to. All right. Last thing to note then is uh, the fact that uh, uh, chapter ten through eleven, in some sense, is one single reality with about eight different scenes, uh, one single story, we might say, with eight different scenes, which kind of toggle back and forth, and so I'll come back and talk about that. Excuse me, we'll meet next week. All right, so with that in mind, um, I do have a question that I asked you to look at. Mm. I'll give you a few minutes to talk about here. So this is my question. And I'm thinking here, of course, of the backdrop of what we just talked about. Um, even though we haven't fully explicated the passage. So it reads, what kinds of lessons about life or about God has it taken you a long time to learn? Because that's what we see, I think, in the story. It takes a while for the church to learn this. And was there anything that you had to unlearn along the way? What are some things that it's taken a while, you know? in life or in your relationship with God that you know you can use whatever. So I'll give you five to seven to talk about it. But come back if you need to go. You certainly can do that. Uh we're we're right at our uh shutting down come time join us. thirty. Yeah. See my friends online. How about I put you guys into a Peggy. Um, Go right down. single break out room. I'll put you guys in there. Uh, go right back. I think one thing that took me a long time to learn is that denominations don't matter. Growing up, it was like I was in the public school. We had the Catholic school. They were like in the beginning. They were doing sure. you know, all that. So and then you need other people who are, have other beliefs, and it's hard 